It's good to be at church, right? For those of us who are here, for those of us who are watching and joining us from right where you're sitting, it's good to be in church for me. It's been four weeks. It's been four weeks since I've been here and I've been missing it. I was in isolation for two weeks. Yes, it's true. I am corona free. Hooray, rejoice. Hopefully where you are, you are too. We're praying for you constantly. But it's a weird season, right? Like I've preached in house churches. I've preached in tiny little churches in the middle of the bush that have had like seven people there. But never have I preached to a live stream, just a live stream. So it's exciting. It's unusual. It's different. But that's the season we find ourselves in, right? It's a weird season. It's a different season. But the good thing about this is that I know because God has told us that wherever his people are gathered, he is with us. And one thing I've actually realized is I don't think he's too fussy about the means of our gathering. <laughs> whether you're sitting with your family or by yourself, or whether you're, but if you're watching this right now, you're joining together with God's people. And he says, I promise to be there with you when you join. Today, we're picking up in the very last message in our season about uh, our series called Pursuing His Presence. So this is part seven. We started a long time ago when the world was a very different place. But we find ourselves here today finishing this. And you know, coming out of this time of isolation, I thought, you know, well, actually, we're going into the time of isolation. I thought, wow, what a time to just stop, to rest, to soak, to, to think about the Lord, to read His Word. And you know, between 8.30 and 3 p.m., I did a bit while the kids were at school. <laughs> Outside of that, it was a little bit chaotic. But I realized that there are so many distractions around us. So many distractions, so many distractions, even right now where you are watching, there's probably notifications popping up. There's all sorts of things happening. There's distractions and voices and sounds and noises. And it actually takes intentionality to step through the noise and the distractions, even when it feels like everything is taken away, even when it feels like there's nothing to do. I have a world of visual content at my fingertips, be it Christian or not. I have so many distractions. There's a sense of requiring an intentionality to step into pursuing God's presence. Because that's what we've been talking about. And that's what we've been pointing our hearts towards. And as a, a church community, wherever we are right now, that's what we've been spending our time pressing into in this season. And it's important because it is a choice. It's an intentional choice. Because it's not our default nature. It's not our cultural norm. It's actually not what we're kind of wired to do in the way we've been raised in our society. And yet, when we make the intentional choice, what we find is fruit flourishes in our lives. Supernatural fruit that comes out of the overflow of being with God. So today I want to just kind of step back a bit. We'll go back to the start a little bit. We'll kind of recap the story, not necessarily of this series, but of us as people in humanity. Because at the start of everything, we were created in God's image. We were created to be with Him. We are image bearers of God designed to be in His presence. That's who we are. That's what we're designed to be. The Garden of Eden is this kind of picture of where God and humanity come together where God and people meet, where there's openness and intimacy, relationship and proximity. We're a dwelling place people. We're a people, a temple people, a place where God's presence rests. That's who we are. That's what we're designed to be. God's always rested. He's always dwelt. He's always been with his people right from the start of the story. Be it the garden, the tabernacle, the temple. But what we know now because of Jesus is that this was always a picture of something that was coming. A dwelling place that isn't made with human hands. It's not a creation of human effort, but in fact, it's a creation of God. It's us. I think it's important to remember in these circumstances that we find ourselves in, that the fear and the disconnect and the worry that we have, I think results more it's a reflection of the brokenness of sin in the world. I, I think the fear is actually less around getting sick for so many people and the fear is more around being isolated and disconnected and removed from intimacy. God created us to be with him and when we broke that relationship, sin entered in and sin breaks down peace. It breaks down joy. It breaks down love. It breaks down everything. And so when we find ourselves in the midst of chaos, we have a choice. 
we can continue to do what we've been doing. We can continue to reflect our culture back to our culture. We can partner with fear and anxiety and, and, and un, the unknown. Or we can step back into what we were created for, which is intimacy. Intimacy with God and intimacy with each other. So what does that look like? What does that mean? Well, let's open scriptures. Let's open up to Mark chapter 4. If you're watching right now live, there's a little Bible tab up the top of the screen for you. You can go look up Mark chapter 4 if you don't have a Bible with you. I'm going to go to chapter 4, verse 35. And this might be a familiar passage to some of you, but it's Jesus and his disciples on the lake. And it reads like this, verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd... They took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, Jesus, asleep on the cushion. And the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, the disciples, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? What we see in this moment, in this story, in this kind of recollection of events from Jesus' life is Jesus being acutely aware of the Father's presence. And with that comes a few things. Jesus knew his authority in this situation, and I would suggest in every situation. Jesus knew the authority he carried because of who his father was. Jesus was also really aware of the calling on his life. Jesus isn't worried about drowning because he knows that God has a purpose for him. and God's going to preserve him through this. But I think the key is, Jesus is aware of the father and his plans in that moment. And I think that's the key. See, Jesus is asleep in the storm. And we might think that's an irrational response. That's like a, that's a sign of maybe mental distress. Maybe it's a sign of denial. Maybe it's something just seems absolutely irresponsible. The reality is Jesus isn't in denial. He has to acknowledge the storm in order to rebuke it, right? He's got to see the storm He speaks to the wind and the waves. He's not like avoiding the fact that there's a storm. It's not a moment of irresponsibility. I think it's actually a moment where Jesus is inviting his disciples into the same awareness of God's presence that he has. He's modeling for them what he's actually been doing his whole ministry so far, trying to have them realize this is what it looks like to live with the Father, to live in intimacy with the Father. I'm acutely aware of what's going on. I think it's the object lesson for the disciples. So right now, in this moment of history, is this our object lesson? And if it is, what is our response? That's the question we've got to ask ourselves. Now, I understand that you might be thinking... It's very easy to say, Jesus, really good at this whole God thing, lots of faith, son of God, able to kind of command the wind and the waves. I'm not Jesus. You're not Jesus. We're not Jesus. And that's correct. We're not. You're not, neither am I. But what's Jesus trying to teach us in this moment? He's trying to teach his disciples a lesson. He asks them, why are you afraid? Why do you have so little faith? What is God inviting us to in this season? What is it that Jesus wants us to see from his perspective? How can we let his presence bear fruit in our lives that allows us to respond to the chaos around us in a way that reflects who he is? Paul kind of finds himself in a similar situation at the end of of Acts. So let's turn to Acts chapter 27, right down the end of Acts. And there's quite a long passage which I'm going to read out. It's a great, great little moment in Paul's life. We're going to pick up in verse 27 of Acts chapter 27. And it says this. 
When the 14th night had come, as we were being driven, says Luke as he's writing, across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors suspected they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. Nice and deep. A little farther on, they took a sounding again and 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run onto the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the, into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. Verse 33, as day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he, Paul, had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. And they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. When they'd eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now, when it was day, and we'll jump forward to verse 41. Striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought to safety, safely to the land. A bit of a different story. Pretty chaotic moment. A pretty horrifying moment. They've been in a storm for 14 days. They don't know what's going on. Everything's falling apart. They're going to start killing people. People are trying to escape. They don't know what's going on. The ship is really near land. There's reefs nearby. It's all going to pot. It's going to fail. Now, Paul had probably heard the stories of Jesus rebuking storms. But Paul doesn't do that, which is weird. Like he's got the testimony of Jesus rebuking storms. What Paul does, in fact, is pay attention to what the Lord's saying. He gives thanks. He instructs people to eat something, to be strong. He doesn't gloriously rebuke a storm, but by paying attention to the Lord's direction with wisdom and faithfulness, he brings everyone safely to land. There's something about what happens when we trust God to do what only he knows how to do. It may not look the same, it may not feel the same. It may not be our glorious moment to stand up and shine, but when God is faithful, he brings us through to the other side. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I think maybe reflecting on his life. He writes this, We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. By great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors, yet are true as unknown yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and not yet killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. This is a guy who's lived through all of that. Riots, beatings, shipwrecks, everything, every calamity you can think of. And he stands and says this, because I think, and what we need to come to as we wrap up this, this idea of pursuing God's presence, looking at the fruit that comes up in our lives as a result, the real fruit of God's presence is not the easy life. In fact, Jesus' life has lived in constant awareness of God's presence, yet, you know, what happened? A painful and horrifying death. Hebrews reminds us that Jesus is our great high priest who's familiar with all of our suffering. The reality of the fruit of God's presence in our lives is actually an awareness of God in every situation and in every moment. 
that he works every situation for his glory and for our good. Paul was prepared to live, to die, no matter what, because he was in love with Jesus. He had a relationship with Jesus that he knew could be trusted. And he knew that no matter what happened, he'd always be with his Lord. For Paul, the reality in this world of natural disasters, demonic attack, crazy military leaders who are oppressing everyone around them, he knew that the entire point of his life was to focus on Jesus. Daily living yielded to him, following the promptings of the Holy Spirit, knowing that each day was a day lived for God and that no matter the circumstance that faced him, dying yet behold, he lives. Our challenge then is our response to our circumstance we find ourselves in. For many of us, we find ourselves in really practically a moment of inconvenience. Life isn't as simple as it once was. I can't just go to the shops like I used to. Things aren't as accessible. For many of us right now, it's actually only just an inconvenience. But for some of us, we're starting to lose income. For some of us, we're starting to find ourselves in unknown territory where people are getting ill, where circumstances aren't like they were, where there's not a quick and easy fix. What's our response in the midst of this circumstance? As I was preparing this during the week, a good friend of mine and one of our elders, Chris Taylor, sent me the message just out of the blue. He said, hey, I just was praying and was reminded of Philippians 4 for you. And it says this in in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. This is the same Paul who was beaten and shipwrecked and eventually martyred for Jesus. The peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. That's the fruit of his presence in our lives. The challenge is, and this is where it gets really practical for everyone, this doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen because I prayed really well this morning. I had the best quiet time <laughs> because I heard this amazing sermon. I streamed 17 church services this week. I had four Zoom calls with every home group I could find. That doesn't instantly produce fruit. As followers of Jesus, we're apprenticed to Him. We're on a journey with Him. And it's a journey for fruit to be cultivated in our lives. And I think fruit is a good metaphor because it takes time for fruit to form. The gardener prepares the plant in order to produce good fruit. They know the right fertilizer, the right water, the right light. They trim it correctly. They they help it grow. They do all the things that help a plant become fruitful. They make the conditions just right for fruitfulness. So the question is for us, what do we do? I think where we can get stuck sometimes, and this is as much for me as as anyone right now, we think that fruit is the goal. So we strive for fruit. I've got to be more peaceful. I've got to have more joy. I've got to do these things. But the reality is, if we cultivate healthy plants, if the gardener spends their time making sure that the plant, the tree, the, the shrub, the bush, the whatever, the vine is healthy and growing well, then fruit is the natural byproduct. Fruit comes as an overflow. Because the reality is for us, fruit is not the goal. That's why it's called the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of my excellent efforts. It's not the fruit of my quiet time, or the fruit of the amount that I tithed, or the amount that I served, or the number of people I witnessed to. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit that comes through intimacy with Him. All of those activities become the overflow, the fruit of His work in my life. It's the overflow of being in a relationship with Jesus. 
I think part of the problem is that we forget this, particularly in our church culture here in River Life, we can become so familiar with God, I think sometimes we forget the powerful transformative effect of His presence. We're so used to our natural rhythms. We come in, we go out, we do the things that we know to do. But I think we sometimes get so familiar, we forget that God's presence transforms us at the depth of who we are. It reverses the curse of barrenness. It reverses brokenness. It reverses the effects of our separation from God. God's presence is the thing that we lost, which through Jesus we've been given back. The result of this restoration is our readmission to the presence of God. And it's there that we become fruitful. We bear kingdom fruit. Jesus talks about this in John chapter 15. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Abiding is the purpose. Fruit is the overflow. So I was thinking about this this week and thought, why fruit? Why fruit is the metaphor? We could build houses, there's body metaphors, there's all sorts of stuff, but why fruit? And I realized that maybe this is just me. Maybe I'm a bit slow. Maybe everyone else already had this. So if you already know this, well done. The Lord's speaking to you. Fruit isn't just for display. There's nothing more dissatisfying than finding a bowl of good-looking fruit on a table and finding it's fake. Fruit is not for display. Fruit is for tasting and experiencing and nourishment. It's to give me energy. It's actually to bless and sustain me. Fruit is best when it's experienced. I don't know about you, but oranges have been amazing lately. I've had some amazing oranges. Man, whew. in Him we'll bear much fruit. So why? Why? Why fruit? Is it to look good to those around us? Is it to be appearing to be an altogether person who doesn't get worried about things, who's got everything right and in order? Or is it because that our lives are designed to provide something for the people around us that God has deposited into us through our relationship with Him? What a promise! What an opportunity. When we pursue God, He transforms us to the point that something happens in our lives that actually blesses the people around us. Something brings life and nourishment and and sustenance and freedom to the people around us. I just heard a testimony while I was in isolation of a guy that I know that I had the pleasure of baptizing, actually. He's been a Christian for, he, he gave his life to the Lord probably last year, I think. And this past week, he led his boss to the Lord in their office. Like, what? That's fruit. There's something that God's done in his life that's produced something that is attractive, but then st- sustaining and nourishing and able to be experienced by someone else. The presence of God in our lives brings the kingdom into every situation that we find ourselves in. In the midst of the kingdom of death and fear and chaos and ruin, God's presence brings the kingdom of love and peace and joy and faithfulness, righteousness, the kingdom of life. I'm convinced of this more than ever, that in this time, in this global season, like every global season and every big global incident that has happened in the last 2,000 years of church history, God's mechanism for blessing the world, for influencing and redeeming our culture, for touching relationships and restoring them is us, His church, through the fruit we produce because of His presence in our lives. So what does that mean for you and me? Some of us, we still get to go out of the house. Some of us are stuck on the couch. What does that mean? Well, originally when we planned this months ago, I was going to say, don't forsake meeting together. Be here on Sundays. Come together. Meet with your life group during the week. Find a a bunch of people whose lives are pointed towards Jesus and invest into that space. Keep doing that. Just because you can't do it physically doesn't mean you can't do it virtually. Like I said, I don't think he's too particular about the means by which we gather. I think he wants us to gather. Video conference isn't here because it wasn't around 2,000 years ago, but I'm sure if we wrote it today, (laughs) join a meeting and praise the Lord. But that's not enough if that's what we think it's all about. We're faced with a season that many of us have never been through before. 
unheard of. Some of us, even some of the oldest of us, like my mum, who's it's her 70th birthday today. Happy birthday, mum. Um, she didn't live through the Second World War. She hasn't experienced uh, this kind of thing before. Some people watching last week had lived through the war as children. And so this isn't unfamiliar to them, but for many of us, this is a whole brand new uncharted space. We don't know what to do. The global financial crisis wasn't as impacting for us. It hasn't impacted us. What do we do when in unheard of circumstances, we can't do the things we used to do? I can't connect with my faith community to get all filled up. I can't come and get prayer from Pastor John. I, I can't get anointed by Pastor Lucian. I can't come and have Pastor Dylan just r- kind of ramp me up in prayer on a Sunday afternoon. What do I do when I'm removed? What happens when I'm left to my own devices? Left to maybe be the one who has to lead my family. The one who has to set an example for my housemates. When no one's watching except them. I've wrestled through that the last few weeks. And we're only going to be confronted with it more and more in the next season ahead. But more and more, this is what the Lord has reminded me. We are connected. That you can't be in the here right now and I can't be where you are right now. But we are connected by unseen things, by His Spirit, by His presence. And more and more we need to be aware of this, more than ever before. We are a temple people and he lives in me and he lives in you. The one spirit unites us together. So more than ever, we need to practice the principles that draw us close to him. I don't ever want the Christian faith to be one that is only marked by disciplines, but disciplines draw us into the passionate expression of love. So we read scripture not to be good, to look good, to have good looking fruit. We read scripture because it draws me to him. And as I get to know him, fruit flows out of my life. I worship not out of obligation. I I don't worship because it's comfortable. I worship even now in my lounge room when it's uncomfortable and awkward because everyone's listening, not because I need to worship to tick the box. But I worship because I need to be with the one who makes sense of the world when nothing else makes sense. We tell others, not because we've got to get quotas for evangelism, We tell others not because it's something that everyone decided to do and I don't want to look like I'm not holding up my end of the bargain. We tell others because the hope we have is like a light set on a stand that everyone needs to see. The fruit of his presence is our assurance in this moment of history that we are God's people positioned by him to be about his kingdom work. It's not a surprise to him. It might be for us. So here's what I want to encourage you with. We cannot afford to lose heart in this season. We cannot afford to forget that above all others, we carry the life-transforming hope of Jesus to those around us. Many who will be spiraling into despair and hopelessness. We cannot afford to forget that God wants to work in each one of us to kill fear, to destroy chaos, to establish love and faith because the reality is that he has overcome. What was hilarious was I was sitting at my lounge room writing, actually at my desk writing this and I had music on in the background and you know, it's the Holy Spirit shuffle mix. The right song always comes on at the right time and I'd just written this out and on comes a song by a guy called David Crowder And the chorus just says, when shadows fall on us, we will not fear. We will remember. When all seems lost, when we're thrown and we're tossed, we remember the cost. We're resting in the shadow of the cross. Like, oh God, you killed me. (laughs) Right in this moment where I'm going, God, we need to overcome. You remind me that we rest in the shadow of your love. Of your love that sets us free. For he has overcome. So I want to leave you with this scripture as we wrap up now. And in John chapter 16, Jesus is having his last conversation with his disciples before he goes to the cross. For them, they don't have clarity on what's going to happen on the other side. They, they've heard him say these things, but it doesn't always make sense. It's not always clear. And he starts to say things that they finally start to get. 
The Father sent me because He loves you and He loves me and I'm gonna go back to Him. And in John 16, verse 29, His disciples reply to Him, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. You can always see Him say, thank goodness. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Verse 31, Jesus answers them. Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Would you bow your heads and would you pray with me where you are? Would you just ignore what's going on around you? The housemates, the kids, the solitude, whatever it is, would you just now take the time to just open up your heart and have a conversation with God? And would you agree with me as I pray these words? Jesus, I thank you that you saved me. And I choose to release to you now my fear, my loss, my anxiety, my concern. Jesus, I know that you hear me when I call out to you. I call and you answer. God, I release to you everything, my success, my safety, I release to you my finances or my lack thereof. I release to you my abilities and skills. God, right now I choose to surrender to you the entirety of my life because I acknowledge right now that you gave it to me anyway. Jesus, because when I give you everything, you promise to hold me tight. You promise that you will look after everything else. When I seek you first, you look after the rest. Jesus, I choose this week to pursue you, to pursue your presence, to make space for you in my life in the midst of chaos, change, loss, and fear. Jesus, I know that because of you, in this season where I need it the most, you are faithful to produce fruit in my life fruit that will sustain me and those around me. Jesus, would you produce fruit in my life that will bless those that I have the opportunity of seeing? Jesus, would you produce fruit in my life that comes from intentionally seeking you and not being complacent when I'm unobserved? God, do you remind me that what you're calling me to will produce fruit for those people that you've placed around me. The people that I speak to, the people that I live with, the people that I connect with. God, in this time where we can't even shake hands, Holy Spirit, you connect us in your unseen space. God, would you give us faith to believe you? Amen.